years. Uh, we moved all over Texas. We lived in Dallas, and Temple, and Childress, and Wichita Falls, or, and then Amarillo. I went to a, when it really got down to it, I went to a different school for every year I went to school. <laughs> and I went to live with my Aunt Mary and my Uncle John out on their farm. And uh, my dad talked, and my dad was getting a salary and commission. And my dad didn't want to share the commission, so he talked the store manager into letting me come down there and be the second person without pay, of course. I didn't get any pay for it, but uh, I was 13 years old. And that, then I began to work in the car shop, and I worked there. I come after school. I got out of school an hour early, and I had all day Saturday and all day, all summer long, for school vacation to work in the shop. And, uh, but the winter of 1935 was one of the hardest winters that they've ever had. For 37 straight days. It never got above zero day or night. Mm -hmm. And my dad was had to go around and virtually start every employee's car that worked for for Henry Fields. And he hated the cold anyway. And after that tough winter, he said right out, he said, this is the last winter I'm going to spend in this damn place. In the spring, we didn't move till July. But my dad got his soldier's bonus of $1,100. And that's what we used to move with and uh, start a new business. That was about 20 years after the end of World War I, something like that? Well, this happened in 1935. The reason dad picked... Oregon to move to was that a good friend of his had moved out to Salem and had gotten a pretty good job and and, and was uh, very pleased with Oregon and he talked dad into moving he that'd be a good place to move so we did we moved to Oregon the only trouble of it was my dad he hadn't had a vacation in years so we made the trip out to Oregon as my dad's prolonged vacation. It took us 15 days to get to get from Nebraska to Oregon, and we spent three days in in uh, Yellowstone Park and huh. any other number of places. And I kept telling Dad, I kept saying, Dad, don't you think we ought to be moving along? We're <laughs> spending a lot of money, and oh, it's all right. Well, by the time we got to Oregon, we had less than three hundred dollars left out of his soldier's bonus. Uh, huh? Out of his soldier's bonus of eleven hundred dollars. Oh my! So we started. We started uh, G and J Tire Service with me as J and my dad as G, and, and <clears throat> my dad had learned how to vulcanize tires when he worked for for U.S. Rubber. So he he decided to go into the and he had been in the retire repair business in Norfolk. Uh, Henry Fields had nine stores, and they had their own private brand of tires. Henry Fields tires, made by Ferris Tire and Rubber Company in Ohio, I think. But I think they're out of business before now. But anyway, they ended up getting the job of repairing all of the tires for all nine stores. And he bought a set of old Firestone molds and started, and he would repair the tires after the store closed in the evening. Mm. And he was only getting, I think, just about a dollar for each tire, and they furnished all the material. Mm. And uh, But he actually began to do quite well at it. But, he fixed enough tires and the commission, getting all the commission and everything. Dad was actually making more money than the store manager was. <laughs> he was making a 
a great big fat fifty dollars a week, which Ooh. boy back in those days was well the the house we rented was on cost only ten dollars a month, so wow. you know that that we were doing My really dad. fine for for uh, paying me for working all summer long. Bought me a, a 1924 Dodge car wow. as payment for it. And how old were you? Possessed him to do that <laughs> since I was only 13 years old, <laughs> and you you couldn't get a driver's license in Nebraska until you were 16. So my my car ended up. Uh, my older sister took it over, and because she could legally drive it. So I lost my car, and I finally ended up uh, just before we left. I ended up just selling it. I got, I paid. Dad paid thirty-five dollars for it, and I ended up selling it. I had put smaller wheels on it, and it looked a little more sporty, and, and I ended up <laughs> selling it for about sixty dollars. And now a mortar is uh, flies almost straight up in the air. So you can put it behind a barn or a fence mm -hmm. or in a hole or behind trees or anything else, and which it makes it very hard for the enemy to see mm -hmm. your, your uh, weapon. And in addition, uh, since we had enough vehicles to bring ammunition in there, and it uh, an 81 mortar, a good mortarman can have nine rounds in the air before the first round hits the ground. So you have a huge element of surprise on your enemy. Yeah. They can be into a terrible barrage and we would fire as many as, as uh, five or 600 rounds in one day. And you can imagine if you only carried 18 with uh -huh. each section, how few you'd be able to fire. And at the end of by the time we got to the bulge, and, and my my uh, platoon had broken up a huge German counter to the performance of my platoon, I got a battlefield promotion and a bronze star and a superior rating and an offer to join the regular army. And my platoon had, had four commendations and the other eight more platoons in I got out the of division the service, didn't get a single one. I was required to write a, an after action report. Now, I got home from Europe in 1946 and they persuaded me to take over Company M in, in 1949. And one of the first things I did was look up the, get the manual for the 81 mortars and to my amazement, there was my after action report in that field manual. They had adopted my method of employment. They had adopted my method of employment. You know, the Percher family had a huge number of doctors in it. Uh, I had two uncles and an aunt that were doctors. And my Aunt Viola was a registered nurse. Now they produced five cousins who were doctors. Hmm. And uh, then my brother and sister, they produced four nephews that were <laughs> of yours, yeah. <laughs> doctors. So we, but now, now all four of my nephews are, are up in their 50s and not one of their children are going to, are going to, medical school. Now, you you lived in Norfolk, Nebraska when you were a kid. Yeah. But your dad was born in Lindsay, Nebraska. Yes. And he was a Val Victorian of his high school. And both my mother and my father uh, didn't speak English when they started school. My dad, Lindsay, Nebraska, is a German community and he spoke German. And Madison, Nebraska, is a Bohemian community, and my mother spoke Bohemian. They both learned English after they <laughs> went to school. I, they might have known some, but 
around the house. Mm -hmm. They all they they were all pretty proud of their heritage, and they a town like Lindsay with mostly Germans, they just birds of a feather flock together. Well, I'm proud of being a Percher. It was a good family. They they got a lot done, and one of the things that when I started working at the shop. And I was helping the family up out. It was a good feeling, and I kind of got onto that thing. I never really, I I really supported my parents. My dad had a stroke when he was only 51 years old, and he was never able to work again. He couldn't even tie his own that shoe. That time on, for, he he lived for 22 years after he had that stroke in 1953. He lived to be 77. But I never really regretted supporting my folks at all. It was a pretty good feeling. And as a consequence, since after I retired, I started driving Dylabus three afternoons a week for free, hauling senior citizens around Corvallis and even as far as Albany. And I enjoyed helping people out, and I still do. My dad was a, a Democrat from way back, and his brother Walt was too. Now, his brother Walt was, I became the treasurer of the Oregon Tire Dealers Association, and it was going broke. And uh, finally, they talked me into becoming the president, and I re redid the due structure and uh, the annual convention, I read it on both and got, not only got the Oregon Tire Dealers uh, back on a firm financial footing, they were even able to hire a full-time worker to, mm. to run the office for the tire dealers. And after I had that luck with the, with the Oregon Tire Dealers, they persuaded me to do the same thing for the Northwest Tire Dealers, which had included Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. And I did the same thing for them. Now, I was also the first World War II officer to command a, an American Legion post. And I commanded the, the post in Corvallis, and I got a new Legion Hall built built for the post uh, using volunteer labor. <laughs> when I was president of the Corral Square Dancers, they had, at that time, they were bringing in, they had a different collar every dance, and they were bringing in a bunch of collars that weren't very good. Mm -hmm. And I had been around enough to knew, know the ones that were good, and so I began to hire, hire the really good callers and I revived the square dance club. They really started to boom after I we started getting good callers in there. Vera and I square danced for 25 years. When was the last time you square danced? Gosh, I don't. <laughs> I have no idea. It was so long ago. We went mm -hmm. a lot, boy. We we square dance. We square dance in Estes Park, which was real something because. The ab the elevation at at Estes Park in Colorado is about six thousand feet, and you can imagine running a square dance at that altitude, boy. <laughs> 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 and one time we were in we were in Las Vegas at at New Year's, and so we started calling around to see how much it would cost to go to the various nightclubs. Mm -hmm. Most of them wanted. Fifty or sixty dollars, oh, and man. I got to checking, and I found out they had a square dance going on that night. So we went out to that and had a hell of a good time for five bucks. <laughs> hey, that's hard to beat. That's John. When my, John, right? When my grandfather and he ran a harness shop, and my when my grandmother died, grandma mother Percher died. She was only barely forty. And after she died, uh, Grandpa Percher drank even more. And my dad was the oldest one of the kids, and he was an apprentice in the harness shop, and he more or less kept it going. The tractor was replaying the horse. My dad, my grandpa used to always say that 
that uh, the horse was coming back, but uh, it never did.